Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today we're going back to February 22nd, 1861, where Americans in the northern states celebrated the 129th birthday of George Washington with a level of enthusiasm beyond any in recent memory, due in large part to a massive wave of an of patriotism for the Union and the Constitution as one Southern state after another broke the sacred bonds that had held them together for the better part of a century. In the Pennsylvania capital of Harrisburg, crowds had another reason to celebrate. On this day, February 22nd, 1861, President-elect Abraham Lincoln came to town. Part of his train heading from Springfield, Illinois, to Washington, D.C. for his inauguration. That afternoon, Lincoln stood on the portico of a local inn and spoke for just a few minutes to the masses that had gathered. In reassuring tones, Lincoln acknowledged the large military force that was present and humbly pledged to do all in his power to avoid bloodshed and preserve peace. Somewhere in that large crowd of well-wishers and celebrants in Harrisburg, a young woman was visiting town from nearby Lewisburg. She listened intently. Her name was Sarah Elizabeth Dysert, and she's pictured here on the left. Her friends called her Sally, and it was spelled with an I-E, not a Y. Sally was so captivated by Lincoln's raw-boned physique and stirred by his eloquence, she came away from the event so inspired, feeling a tug of patriotism and a desire to serve the country. She wrote about that first impression of President-elect Lincoln, quote, all that was good was with him. There was no bad. Weeks later, after the bombardment of Fort Sumter called North and South to arms, Sally may have recalled Lincoln's words as she watched fresh-faced citizen soldiers marching through the streets of Harrisburg on their way to war. As they passed, she wondered who would take care of them when they were taken sick or wounded in battle. By the time the last soldier marched by, she had made a resolution to get involved and get even with the Southern states and the new Confederate nation even if it cost her life. Those who knew Sally expected nothing less. Raised on a sprawling estate nestled in the rolling hills west of Harrisburg in the Blair County hamlet of Tipton, Sally and her eight siblings held from a family that included a Revolutionary War officer and a prosperous iron master. Sally came from some wealth. She wanted little while she was growing up careful religious instruction in the Baptist church, singing lessons in Baltimore, a formal education at the respected Lidditz Seminary, and later the Lewisburg Female Academy at Bucknell University. She might have been in college for a longer period of time, but the war interrupted Sally's life at the academy. She promptly enlisted as a nurse and started her service on or about New Year's Day of 1862. Medical authority has assigned her to Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Here, she joined the hospital of the 12th Army Corps, with which organization she developed a deep and lasting attachment. It's composed of two divisions rather than the usual three. The 12th was a smaller size corps, but it made up for that size with a reputation of being composed of hard-fighting crack regiments. The 12th fought with distinction at Antietam, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, Lookout Mountain, and elsewhere, led by some of the Union's finest generals, among them Alphea Starkey Williams and Henry Warner Slocum. All wore the five-pointed star badge to designate them from other corps. Sally was there through all of it. She treated the wounded and sick of that 12th Corps from battlefield to battlefield, and she was known for often singing 
to her patience and what was described by many as an unusually lovely voice. Sally also proved a capable leader as evidenced by her being in charge of Ward 3 at Camp Letterman after the Battle of Gettysburg. During that long and difficult summer, Sally took a moment to pose for this photograph with a periodical in hand with two fellow Pennsylvanians and Lewisburg female academy graduates with whom she served as nurses. Her cousin, Annie Bell, who's in the center, and on the right, Sarah Chamberlain. This trio of sisters served together in Tennessee for a good long portion of their service. Sally spent most of the end of the war at hospitals in Chattanooga and Nashville. That was after Gettysburg. In one of the hospitals at the latter place, she headed up the kitchen staff in addition to her regular duties. She continued on until May of 1865 when she received a discharge from the army. She left with two parting gifts. A group of patients took up a collection, bought her a gold watch as a token of their appreciation. Also, a cadre of medical staff presented her with a star-shaped pendant, the core badge, crafted of gold and set with a cross and pearls. One side included an engraved dedication, which said, quote, to Sarah E. Dysert from the medical officers of the 12th Army Corps, end quote. The other included another engraving, a biblical passage from Matthew 25, the parable of 10 virgins, it said, quote, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, ye have done it unto me, end quote. There's one other tribute that's worthy of note. There's a letter from the man who impressed her in Harrisburg on Washington's birthday, which seemed so long ago in 1861. It's a letter from Abraham Lincoln. He wrote to her, and that letter says in parts, quote, your glorious contribution to the morale of the Union forces, my dear lady, will remain as a bright page of this terrible period, and the succor you gave the dead and dying shall remain forever as a blessing, end quote. This letter from President Lincoln, along with part of a uniform of one soldier boy who never made it home, numbered among the relics stored by Sally, in an old chest after she returned to Tipton. Sally spent the rest of her days involved in activities connected to her church, charitable organizations, including temperance and missionary societies. Like many women who served as nurses during the war, they went on to become part of the progressive movement of the latter parts of the 19th century. In 1893, she received a government pension for her war service, but because she was well off and didn't really need the money, she donated it to philanthropies and continued to do that until her death from pneumonia in 1909 at age 71. She never married, but five of her brothers and sisters survived her. Her funeral, so it was said, was attended by several hundred mourners. So well was she respected and beloved. Her remains were laid to rest in the Dysart Family Cemetery, a line she penned on a postcard for a Sunday school exercise I think could serve as a fitting epitaph for her life and Civil War service. That line reads, quote, without courage, one cannot be strong, and without strength, one cannot be courageous. So thanks for listening. See you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.